Take your Bibles and open them to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, we'll look at verse 7. And in these words we find this. It says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. May the Lord bless the reading of his inerrant and infallible divine holy word. Question of the hour is, again, what is a Christian supposed to do? Well, I believe first and foremost, we must know assuredly that we are a Christian. Because we cannot do anything as a Christian unless we are one. And once we have that affirmation of faith in our heart, then we must, I believe, repent daily and personally from our sins. Because again, like I said, we have been saved from sin's power that would send us to hell, but not from sin's presence, which is all about us. Then, I believe we should grow earnestly in the Lord. And that is, we must advance from spiritual adolescency unto spiritual maturity, from the milk of the word unto the meat of the word. Then we must pray fervently unto him. For you see, it's a relationship between us and God. He's our father, we are his children, and he expects us to call on him every once in a while. No, not every once in a while, a lot. In fact, he says in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now this morning, we are going to see that we should love tenderly. But why? Why should we as Christians be a people that shows forth love? I believe the answer is found in our text. In the latter part of that verse I just read, verse 7, Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. In other words, it should just come natural that we love one another and that we love God. So at this time, I'm going to share a couple of things in regards to the love that we as Christians are to express. The first thing I want to say is that we are commanded to love. The 21st verse in the book of Jude says, and it's only one chapter in Jude, says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Notice that verse does not say, think about loving others and loving God. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God. That means we have, and we're to ask no questions. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it, and no conditions set upon it. The Bible says we are to be a people that shows forth love. So, who are we to love then? I believe that first of all, we should love God first, supremely, preeminently, before all, before everyone. In fact, Jesus said this in uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. He also said it in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it's all a quote of Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So God's word says we are to love him supremely, preeminently, before all. We must love God. question of the hour then is this. Has he given us reason to love him? Has he given us a a legitimate reason to love him? Is he worthy of our love? Do I need to ask that question? Come on now. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. and, And on that rugged cross was the Lamb of God who died for you and I. Do I have to ask that question? John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world, He gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
I don't need to ask that question. No, I don't. It's so clear. It's so distinctly clear why we should be motivated to love God. Then I will tell you this. He says to us in his word, not only that we should love him first and foremost before all, but then he also says in his word that we should love one another. We should love others, secondly, after him. It says in 1 John 4, 11, and it should be right there on the page where you're at. 1 John 4, 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, and I don't really like that word if in that verse, it really should be the word since. And a lot of times you will notice in the King James languages, language, if you see the word if, it really should mean since. And so in this case, it would mean uh, that, as it would say, Beloved, if God so loved us, we have no question that God loves us. We know it, we see the evidence, the cross. So it should be read this way, Beloved, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It doesn't say think about it, pray about it, consider it, weigh the options. No, it just emphatically says we ought also to love one another. Come on, someone say amen. amen. It does say that. It says that. If we, have, if we harbor hate in our heart, if we have a, a grudge towards someone, if we dislike someone, we are hating, holding a grudge against, and disliking someone of whom God loved so much he sent his son to die on the cross for them. We are harboring hate and a grudge and disliking someone that God's son loved so much he was willing to walk the Via Della Rosa at that hill, carrying that cross beam and laid himself down upon that timber, took the old rusty nails in his hands and died for them. How dare we hate someone of whom God loved that much? So the Bible says we should love him supremely, and it also says we should love one another, secondly, after him. Why does that come secondly after him? Well, it's just common sense. We cannot love others until we first love God. And if we don't love others, then that is possible evidence that we, not, we don't love God as we should. In fact, not possible. It's pretty clear evidence. Because if we truly love God, we'll have a natural tendency to love others. We will. Now, who are the others that we're to love in our lives? Well, our neighbor. It says to us, and now again, Jesus quoted this. He said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 39, in Mark chapter 12, verse 31, and in the latter part of Luke chapter 10, verse 27, he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we shall love our neighbor. And those were quotes by Jesus of Leviticus 19, 18, which says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then God signed off on that and said, Because I am the Lord. Why should we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Because God is Lord and he told us to. Now, who is our neighbor then? It was a rich lawyer who was asking Jesus that question when Jesus told him. And then he, he gave him the story of the, the Good Samaritan in, in Luke's version of this. Who is the neighbor? Well, I, I should say that our neighbor is anyone and everyone who lives and dwells within the shadow of the steeple of our church. That is everyone who is in our community. They are our neighbor. You say, well, there are drug addicts in our community. There are alcoholics in our community. There are domestic abusers in our community. There are all kinds of people that live around us that speak vile and corrupt language, and they are just horrible people. And, and I cannot love them as my neighbor because of who they are or because of what they do, because of how they live. Listen, let me tell you something. I believe with all of my heart that many and we're, we're like that, that we're in the, the, 
Matthew's home when Jesus went to the tax collector's home and ate dinner with them, and the religious hypocrites, that is the Pharisees and the scribes, came and approached the disciples and said, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? And Jesus said, They that are sick need the physician, not they that are whole. And so let me tell you that everyone within the shadow of the steeple of our church, no matter, no matter who they are, no matter how, much, how they look, no matter how they talk, no matter what languages they speak through their mouths, no matter what level of education they may have, it doesn't matter who they are, we are to love them. We're to love everyone. We're to love everyone. And our neighbors include everyone that we come in contact with, it is the lady that checks us out at the grocery store when we're in line. It is the man who is behind us at the traffic light when the light turns green and we don't take off quick enough and he honks his horn at us and we get mad. No, 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 wait a minute, that's our neighbor. We're to love our neighbor. It doesn't matter who it is. Anywhere and everywhere. When we come in contact with people, they're our neighbors. And the Bible says we must love them. And if we truly love God, I'll tell you, it should come natural. Then I will say that um, the others that we are to love not only includes our neighbor, but it includes our family. It says in the Bible that a husband should love his wife to the, uh, in the, with the same kind of love that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That is, in other words, a sacrificial kind of love. It says also in God's word that a wife is to be submissive to her husband. That is, she is to love him tenderly with all her heart, supremely and preeminently, and again, sacrificially. It says in God's word that parents are to love and nurture their children. I see stories all the time of parents being cruel to their kids and treating them scornfully and badly and even hurting them. It says in God's word that children should love their parents we hear all the time about <clears throat> children being abusive and horrible to their parents, too. And it says clearly in God's word that children should love their parents. There should be brotherly love in the home. There should be Christian love in the home. There should be agape love in the home. There should be a close love between parents and their children and brothers and sisters and all who are in the household. Not only must we have Christian love toward one another, and I, and I will believe this, and I will say this again, I will continue to echo the words I've already said, I'll say them repeatedly, I will say, I will say, and I mean it with all of my heart, that if we truly love God, we'll love our family as we should. And if we don't love our family, then there's, there's a problem with our relationship with the Lord, serious problem. Because if we truly love Him, then we will love others, including our family. And when I say family, I'm talking about extended family too. Yeah, I got uncles, aunts, cousins, no, no, no. Those, yeah, but that is extended family. We're to love them too. But I'm talking about our church family here. We're all blood related. That's right. I'm your brother by blood. And you say, well, no, no, you're not. You're not related to me. Yes, I am. You're related to me. You're my brothers and sisters, all by blood. That is the shed blood of the Lamb of God on the cross. He adopted us, and he signed the certificate in his blood. He sealed it with his Holy Spirit, and we are all blood-related. We are blood-related to one another. We are the family of God. We are brothers and sisters. He is our Father. We are his children, and we are to love one another in the church. But that man over there, that woman over there, said something unto, to me one time that hurt my feelings. Get over it. But no, 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 Pastor, you can't just say that. That, that man over here, that woman over here, crossed me one time. They did something that is unbecoming of a child of God. Forget them and get behind it and go on. Because we're a family. And his family, we should love one another. In fact, you know, I asked God to give me a verse to address that. And this is what he gave me. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another. That means love one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. We should love others before we love ourselves. And if we love God, we'll learn how to do that. And then the others includes not only our neighbors and our family and our extended family in the church, but it also includes, listen to this, our enemies. We all have someone probably that doesn't like us, I, I would imagine. I'm in a leadership position. I'm a pastor. So I know I've got people that probably don't like me, and that's all right. I love them. You know, I thought about this this week. What if someone doesn't like me? That's, between, that's an issue between them and God that they, they're going to have to resolve with him. But as far as me on my end, I love them. If there's anyone that feels like they just can't stand the ground, I walk on. That's all right. I love them. You know, Jesus told us to love our enemies. He said in Matthew 5, verse 43, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And he would never ask us to do anything that he would not do himself. Do you know that Jesus had enemies? Oh, yes, he did. You read all through it in the Gospels, and you see how those religious hypocrites have been preaching on, on Sunday nights here recently. Hey, yeah, those men, they hated him, and they wanted him killed. They wanted him destroyed. They wanted him killed. Yes, they did. They turned him over unto Herod and to Pilate. And they ultimately saw their wishes come to fruition when they saw him die on that cross. But they did not see this coming. And that is when he came forth alive from the dead. He told them, but they didn't believe it. But he had enemies. The apostle Paul was once his enemy. His name was Saul back then. But he was an enemy, and Saul knew all about the enemies of the cross of Christ. In fact, he wrote these words in Philippians 3.18. He said, many walk of him I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are the enemies. You know, what did Jesus do with his enemies? Did he say, uh, God, send down multitudes of angels to trounce them, to pulverize them into obliteration? No, he did not. He did not do that. He said, I'm going to the cross for you. I will die for you. For whosoever will call upon me to receive me as Savior. So, we are to love God. Who are we to love? We're to love God preeminently and supremely before all. And we are to love others. And our others are our neighbors, our family, and even our enemies. Now, the next thing I want to say is we are taught how to love. By whom? Who taught us how to love? Well, let me say we have all received life lessons on how to love from God the Father himself. See, God the Father created this world, and he gave us a great place to live in. You know, I hear all the time about people in politics talking about climate change, and that's, that's everyone's personal opinion. But let me say what I think is truly destroying the world is nothing to do with the climate. It has to do with sin. It is the same thing that caused God to send a universal worldwide flood during the time of Noah. It is the same thing that caused God to send fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, it is sin. It is wickedness. It is immorality. We have messed up this beautiful world that God has given us with sinful lives and with sin in our hearts, and, and, and we need to ask God to forgive us for that. But he, he has given us a beautiful life to live in. Life is good. Life is good. And many will say life is not good. Life is hard. When we put things in perspective and realize that we as Christians are bound for heaven, it should help us get uh, to the understanding that life is not as bad as we sometimes think it is. We've got a lot better off than we ever uh, would, uh, would understand if we just put it in perspective. And let me tell you something. 
uh, you know, David understood it. David understood that life was good and every day was a day to praise the Lord and thank him. Every day we wake up, we ought to say, God, thank you for giving me another day. Thank you for giving me a day to love my family. Thank you for giving me another day to live my life. Thank you for giving me another day for me to be a witness for you. We ought to be like David who said in Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will be glad we rejoice in it. We will rejoice and be glad in it, it says. Then I will tell you that we have been taught by God the Father, life lessons on love and his judicial punishment of sin and his sacrificial forgiveness of sins. It's all summed up in one verse, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then I will say that we have received life lessons on how to love from God the Son. Not only from God the Father, but from God the Son. Uh, you look at it. Just go from Matthew chapter 1 and read all the way through uh, John chapter 20. You go through all four of the Gospels and you will see, or John chapter 21, you will see in those four Gospels, you will see the life lived by Jesus, which was a life of compassion, a life of tenderness, a life of love, a life that he poured out unto others. Everywhere Jesus would see someone in a dilemma, he would stop to help them. If he saw someone with a need, he would stop to fulfill that need. If he saw someone with a sad face, it doesn't say that in the Bible, but I would imagine he would stand and smile to them and try to cheer them up because he cared for everyone. He loved all people. And this is what it says in Matthew 9, 36. One time he saw the multitude and he was moved with compassion toward them. Hey, I'll tell you, when he saw the Samaritan woman sitting at Jacob's well, he saw a woman who had a need, a spiritual need, and he loved her so much that he went to her and met that need. I, I will tell you that when he saw uh, the, the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, he saw a man who was crippled and could not walk. He saw him and he loved him and he automatically stopped and responded and told that man, take up your bed and walk. Uh, when he saw Mary at the tomb uh, of her brother Lazarus, it says Jesus wept. He loved her. When he saw Zacchaeus up in the tree, he looked at him and he stopped. And out of love, he said, come down for today I must abide at your house. When he saw the two thieves, one on either side, he had love for them. One denounced him and railed against him, cursed him and rejected him. But the other one said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus lovingly said to him, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Everything about Jesus we see is love. He loved tenderly everyone he was around. So we have received life lessons on how to love from God the Father and also from God the Son. And God the Son has given us this word. In John 15, verse 9, he said to us this, As the Father hath loved me, even so love I you. Continue you in my love. Continue in my love. Jesus told us, taught us how to love. There is no love ever has been or ever will compare to the love of God. 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And then the latter part of that verse says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So as he has loved us, we should love one another. Yeah, here's what we need to do. What must a Christian do? We must know assuredly that we are a Christian, that we know that we know that we know we are bound for heaven. We must repent personally from our sins every day, all the time, because we are confronted by the devil all the, uh, every day with temptations and, and we sin because we're human. And we need to grow earnestly in the Lord. Yeah, it's time we get serious about spiritually growing up. And we do need to pray fervently unto him. That is passionately and hard. Yes, we need to do all of those things. But as children of God, we should and must love tenderly. Does everyone hear me? We must be a people 
that are a people of love. In conclusion, I'll tell you about a little girl one time who was a Christian, a young child, and she said, and she was told that Jesus was in her heart. And she told her mama one day, she said, Mama, how can I tell Jesus I love him? And her mama told her different ways, of course. And, and then she thought of something herself. And she said, here's how I'm going to tell Jesus I love him. Mama, Jesus is in my heart, right? She said, yes, dear, she, he is. So she went and got a piece of paper and a pen. And she wrote big letters. She wrote, I, and made a great big old heart and colored it red and, and wrote the word you, I love you. Then she took it, watered it up real small, and put it in her mouth and swallowed it. She said, Jesus, you're in my heart. I want you to keep, uh, receive this love note from me. Now, that being said, don't, please don't do as I said. Don't go home and take paper and eat it. Okay? Just, just a side note there. But let me tell you another story, and this is the last one, and this is how I conclude. There's a boy and a girl that were dating, young couple. And that boy, oh, he's a young guy. He's just gushing over his girl. He loved her so much. And they had gone out on a date. They were going to go out on another date the next night. But he pulls up in the driveway, brings her home. He's sitting beside her in the car, and he said to her, Honey, he said, I love you so much, I could not live without you. I love you so much, dear, that I'd go to the ends of the earth for you. I love you so much, honey pie, that I'd, I'd walk through fire for you. I love you so much, sweetheart, that I would die for you. Then he gave her a, a kiss and walked her to the door and said, sweetheart, I'll see you tomorrow night if it doesn't rain. <laughs> Our actions speak louder than words. It's easy for us to say, God, I love you. It's easy for us to say, God, I love others. I love my neighbors. I love my family, my church family. I love my enemies. And I forgive them. I love them dear to my heart. It's easy for us to say words, but boy, how it speaks volumes when we show forth our love through actions. God wants us to love tenderly, and he wants us to prove it in our lives by our actions. How tender is our heart? Do we truly love others as we should? Do we truly love God? If we'll love God, we'll love others. That's where it starts. And he's given us reason to love him for all that he has done for us. Let us pray.